for joining us. Um, uh, we are going to go through part of uh, our work uh, based on um, a publication we've recently uh, published in Global Transitions uh, named Competitive Priorities to Address Optimization in Biomass Value Chains. Uh, and we've illustrated within the paper the case of Biomass CHP. We won't include it in the presentation today, but you're very welcome to read through the paper. Um, mm. So, biomass value chains, what are the key issues uh, about them and why address them in a value chain mode? Uh, first, they are in increasingly varied and innovative. Uh, they have to comply with resource efficient and sustainable practices. Uh, and very often, they are um, uh, the evidence is provided through complex, open ended, or inconsistent and unrelated metrics, which prohibits comparability and understanding uh, across value chains, but also across the sectors these value chains uh, are uh, being uh, servicing. Um, and uh, there is often lack of coherence in system thinking to incorporate the challenges and not only uh, a sector challenge, but detailed challenges within the value chain stages. Uh, who it interrelate physical assets uh, with market attributes and this uh, so far at least has not been fully addressed uh, with single target optimization meaning uh, only by trying to optimize the greenhouse gas performance uh, of a biomass value chain or carrier does not always uh, perform uh, offer the best of performances across the value chain. We've used the principles of value chain analysis as presented uh, by Porter. Uh, of course, there are many researchers here. I just mentioned one um, uh, uh, paper, but so there are plenty uh, that can be found on the value chain and the competitive advantages. Um, so we try to combine um, value chain approaches to address the interconnectivity across the value chain stages, and we've also in layer them with competitive priorities to focus the uh, the analysis on the real challenges that uh, uh, prohibit the uh, sustainable and resource efficient development of value chain uh, in biomass, um, bioenergy, bioeconomy. Uh, so we have three stages. One is understanding the system, uh, defining the key stages and underlying activities within the biomass value chains, identifying the challenges that trigger the major uncertainties and explore competitive priorities. Uh, that will foster sustainability and resource efficiency. Um, second is focusing uh, on uh, addressing economic, social and environmental challenges that the biomass value chains face. And to do that, we propose uh, a set of metrics uh, that are fit to measure performance, overcome the specific challenges and steer focus on the competitive priorities within the value chains. And finally, we have uh, optimization strategy landscapes, which uh, aim to improve evidence, allow stakeholders to trace the rationale of any decision, and also enable monitoring future projections and comparisons. Uh, a very uh, brief, uh, quick look on the system, uh, value chain stages and activities, uh, it's very obvious that the biomass value chain goes through land use most of the times, unless uh, it is uh, based on algae or marine ecosystems. Uh, you have the biomass production, uh, conversion and end products. And of course, within each of them, you do have uh, several activities. Uh, and uh, in the interface, there are critical issues that need to be met for uh, uh, performing under sustainable and resource efficient principles. Uh, so from land use to biomass production, you have to make sure that you have a land suitability from biomass production. As you move to conversion, you have to secure sustainable source uh, raw material on an annual basis. Uh, and then from conversion to end products, you have to have a resource efficient valorization, both of the main products, but also of the various co-products through biorefining and cascading principle. Why competitive priorities? Which competitive priorities we've used so far? You will, uh, we will talk uh, with Asa and Thomas in detail with them for them, but. Um, 
In our analysis, we have used flexibility, uh, meaning the ability to expand or adjust the capacity, the volume and the product design. Uh, this allows us to ensure year round uh, biomass supply that can be adapted to local ecology and climate uh, and to adjust conversion pathways and scales uh, uh, to convert to raw materials with variable qualities to energy fuels and bio-based products. Uh, we include in the analysis quality uh, as uh, meaning uh, improving process and product performance and adherence to quality standards uh, because it is very important that uh, the quality of raw materials practices and end products uh, is safeguarded uh, for the uh, successful establishment and uninterrupted alteration uh, throughout uh, the value chain lifetime. Of course, we have cost, a critical element for the viability or even the decision making to proceed with implementation. Uh, and uh, competitiveness is uh, strongly related within individual value chain stages with land use and biomass production most of the times accounting for 40 to 50 percent of the total uh, production cost. Uh, also, as technologies get more innovative, creating value with improving cost, having cost reduction uh, as the technologies move through uh, the technology readiness level from the uh, research to the commercialization. It is very important because uh, there is the risk uh, of the valley of death which needs to be um, uh, safeguarded as well and uh, go to full commercialization with improved costs. Uh, then we do uh, include innovation. There is a lot of innovation both in the raw material practices and the conversion pathways um, and transparency. There have been and there are and there will be uh, various debates about the sustainability of biomass and about its uh, efficiency to uh, use uh, natural assets and whether uh, up to which extent, which are the boundaries uh, so being transparent and having uh, a monitoring system, uh, a, a monitoring system to address the impacts and report them is a critical issue uh, to avoid displacement uh, for other activities and sectors, improve clarity and awareness of the benefits from implementing the value chains and also more important, create trust among the society. Um, so we uh, use the competitive priorities to um, address the challenges. Uh, we, there are, of course, various challenges within our uh, paper. We have uh, grouped them in value chain stages. So for land use, we have minimizing competition, avoiding displacement and improving land quality and maintaining soil organic matter. And the relevant quality priority, competitive priorities are quality, innovation, transparency and cost. Um, when we, as we move to biomass production, we need to ensure year-round sustainable biomass supply, uh, have competition of biomass feedstocks, biodiversity loss, uh, maintaining low input and less intensive cropping practices, safeguarding the soil compaction and soil carbon, minimizing the emissions and reducing the carbon footprint of storage and transport. And uh, we have uh, uh, been matching them with the cost, innovation, flexibility and quality. Uh, conversion includes the site selection of the plant location, so probably uh, co-location uh, of uh, close to existing infrastructures like, bio -refin uh, like refineries, access to technology, the low emissions, handling mixed volumes of variable material and uh, optimizing synergies uh, for valorization of residues and products. And this is including uh, the pri competitive priorities of innovation, quality, flexibility and cost. And finally, uh, the end users, um, a key element of the value chain. Uh, so uh, we have to ensure uh, that uh, there's compatibility of the bio commodities with both the processes and the standards and that uh, they will replace and not compete uh, ex with existing uh, infrastructure and uh, distribution channels. And of course, a critical element again is the engagement of the society, their awareness, their understanding and their perception. And there we've match we're matching quality, cost and transparency. We I will show in the end the relevant uh, optimization strategy landscapes for the policies. So the metrics to address the challenges, we will share uh, this uh, with um, Asha, uh, who is focused
social and Thomas and the environmental. I will only touch briefly on the economic sustainability, um, which uh, we are, are addressing in the affordability of land prices, the bonus production and purchase costs, the cost efficient conversion, uh, market and price dynamics and local employment. And uh, we have been uh, grouping the different indicators, activities and uh, value chain stages. Uh, so you can see that uh, the indicator we're using for cost is the levelized uh, life cycle cost. Uh, we also use technology readiness level both for feedstock and for conversion uh, investment, uh, gross value added, uh, and for jobs we use the full-time employment across the value uh, full value chain. So number of full-time jobs uh, it depends per ton or uh, per gigajoule of end products. And uh, last, uh, the contribution to the rural economy, which is the gross value added to the rural economy. Uh, per ton of product. I will now pass the floor to uh, Asha to explain to you how we work around social sustainability. Asha. Thank you. Thank you, Poppy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so in next few slides, I'll be mainly talking about how um, we have selected some of the social indicators for our own work, not only for the pro uh, paper that Poppy is presenting from the beginning, but also other project works. Uh, and um, I'll talk about the key challenges of social sustainability and the role of stakeholders in the optimization of the biogest value chains and the tools, some of the tools that we have explored uh, for mapping of the stakeholders to understand their roles and linkages in the value chains. And uh, lastly, I would like to share some of the ideas about going forward, how we see the role of the social indicators in the assessment of the uh, bio-based value chains uh, and also to inform the bioeconomic policies uh, just to explore some of the research avenues. So next slide. Okay. Thank you. And uh, here, uh, what I've tried to show here is that, um, like Poppy mentioned, across the value chain stages, uh, the selection of the set of indicators is usually determined by the activities within each stages of the value chains. And it uh, varies from the focus of the value chains and the context so does the social impact with the, uh, of these activities under the value chain stages and the criteria to assess the social sustainability are different from projects to projects and the tasks to tasks. So the indicators, ultimately, the set of indicators that we use uh, ends up being uh, different slightly. And uh, it's usually based on the spatial and temporal scale of the assessment that we are trying to do. So um, here in this slide, you can see some of the papers that I try to bring here are which has provided us with a set of uh, indicators for the assessment of the uh, biofuel and bioenergy in the bioeconomic context. And we can see it's quite an extension list. So whereas we as a researcher, um, we try to identify um, we, uh, you know, key a few indicators which will be able to help us to identify the good practices of the uh, current uh, bio-based value chain projects and how do they inform the policies and how they can be translated into knowledge to other contexts. So keeping these in mind, uh, selecting a set of indicators is always a challenge which covers a wide breadth of scope uh, and as well as which requires a less resource. Uh, so, so the guiding principles are usually the feasibility to measure within the time frame that of the project. Um, and also the administrative cost and the burden on the project uh, partners and the uh, people who are conducting the research. So, yeah, so next slide. Uh, here, um, I've tried to show some of the examples of the different projects and the different project tasks and how under each project task we have set of indicators. And these are usually determined by the task objectives. And um, as a researcher, and which, uh, which I say here top down, because we try to select uh, indicator based on the availability of the data in the literature, because most of the time the work that we do is based on the desk based research and we have to rely on the big database uh, that's out there. So, so uh, besides the availability of data, we also, uh, because our work is mainly focused on informing the policymakers and building a policy framework. So we try to see if there is a, uh, these indicators that we have selected has the ability to inform the policy and decision makers. And, and also its proximity 
the CAP, the Common Agriculture Policy Indicators, because we are looking into the agriculture value chains, and which uh, is influenced by the changes in the within the CAP framework. And uh, another key is the um, we have used social development goals as the benchmark because the of the link of the larger uh, EU bioeconomic goals, um, and and also try to see if these uh, indicators can be combined with the economic and environmental impact assessment because. The idea is that these uh, impacts, social impact, doesn't happen in silo and they are complex, so they are intertwined. So we try to find an indicator which can inform both the economic and environmental impact assessment as well. So you can see um, employment is one of the repeating indicators because it's regarded as one of the primary motivators by the uh, policymakers because it's widely tracked and the data is uh, available under employment. And employment also gives us uh, insights, uh, not only of the local and regional economy, but also at the value chain level, because uh, it is uh, contingent on the feedstock uh, that uh, is uh, chosen for the production or the distribution option chosen by the distributors or the conversion pathway that's selected. So it gives us uh, an insight into the value chain level activities, uh, So which allows um, to draw information to inform the economic growth impacts of the specific value chains in the specific regions. Uh, so one other um, social indicator that we have selected for the paper is the contribution to the rural economy. And that ties to the com competitive priorities of the transparency because it provides evidence to support the development of uh, new knowledge uh, sharing and building up the partnership and creating an acceptance uh, within the uh, stakeholders of the value chain because we are talking about the innovation happening in the agriculture uh, bio-based value chains within the context of bioeconomy, which is evolving. Um, so uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, here, um, what, what we, this is a part of the work that uh, we did for the presentation of a conference paper. So. We try to see uh, the, uh, the bottom of approach of the selection of the social indicators. By that, I meant uh, if the indicators that we have selected for our own research uh, tasks, uh, do they match with some of the indicators that comes from the bottom up? And then we did the literature review uh, of the publications, which is based on the survey of farmers and the agricultural stakeholders, and to, uh, which have tried to understand the perceptions and opinions of the these community on the exploitation of the marginal lands for the energy crop production. So the color coding here you see is mainly to divide the socioeconomic and environmental indicators. So our focus was only on the yellow highlights, the social impact uh, indicators. So what we saw was there was a similarity in the choices of the indicators, which were thought important by the farmers and the agriculture community. For example, employment, income uh, opportunities, profit at the farm level were some of the similarities of the social indicators selected by the uh, farmers community, whereas the key difference that I uh, we found in this uh, risk, uh, uh, analysis was that the perception of the marginality that comes from the researcher's point of view is usually limited to the biophysical marginality, whereas the uh, way the marginality is seen by the farmers and the agriculture community is also tied to the social and the economic marginality of the land, and which also incorporates the knowledge about the suitability of these agricultural lands and the existing knowledge this local people hold uh, on the agriculture and soil management practices. So these were some of this uh, like slight difference that we saw in the selection of the indicators that they thought was important in the top down and the bottom up approach. Next slide. So here. Um, uh, what I wanted to share was that in order to understand uh, um, if the selected indicators, uh, like uh, the uh, social impact indicators that we have selected and the metrics that we have used are adequate to inform policies, now we also need to focus on the key challenges um, that these uh, indicators try to uh, assess. So the idea is that uh, in each uh, value chain stages, the, um, the social to ensure the social sustainability, the challenges are different. For example, in the land use, it is usually the perception of the farmers in, in regards to the categorization of the land, exploitation of the marginal land. Uh, 
And in biomass production stage is usually the knowledge and skill of the farmers and the agri uh, agricultural community in large. And in conversion, it's again the knowledge and the capacity of the SMEs and industries to adopt the new advanced technologies to understand the applications and to capitalize on the financing mechanism that's out there to help them upscale their conversion uh, from pilot scale to the demonstration stage or to, and further. And similarly, in the end use uh, stage, it's usually the awareness and the perception of the consumers about the sustainability of these by this uh, value chain. So uh, all these stakeholders involved uh, in the value chains, there is a flow of products, uh, knowledge and information among themselves across the value chain stages. And they all have a key role to play to address these challenges that I just mentioned. So the how do these uh, stakeholders engage uh, in the exchange of these products and uh, knowledge and information, or how do they capitalize their social and economic capital to strengthen the position, or how do they influence in the value chain uh, based on the knowledge and skill and also the perception and the values about uh, value chain, uh, um, by these value chains, uh, ultimately impacts the sustainability of the value chain. So, um, since the idea is that social acceptance uh, across the value chain is a key uh, transition towards uh, the upscaling of these uh, by this uh, value chain, so the roles of the stakeholders uh, is very important. Uh, next slide, Poppy. So um, here, I uh, what I wanted to share is that. Uh, um, it is from our project Panacea where uh, we try to build the thematic networks of the stakeholders. Um, so one of the exercises that we did was of the mapping of the stakeholders and we uh, mainly categorized them into four uh, groups uh, using the concept of quadruple helix. And we explored uh, some of the possible tools to um, do a social network analysis. Um, and uh, what I presented here in this uh, slide is the Menlo framework. And um, uh, here the mapping is mainly done based on the influence and the interest of the stakeholders involved. Uh, so, and the other uh, tool that we also tried to look into was the NVivo and network sociogram, which where it would allow us to understand the interconnectedness and the linkages among the stakeholders to understand their bonds and what kind of uh, knowledge sharing, the knowledge flow happens within these linkages uh, or the resource flow. So, so the main idea was to understand from these exercises is to how stakeholders view their own uh, socioeconomic capital within an innovation system. So the innovation system being the, uh, the biased value chains they're exploring. And um, unfortunately, in, in regards to the Panacea project, the GDPR regulation kicked in as we were collecting information, as we were building this database of the stakeholders, and we could not move uh, too further in, without these initial ideas of the social network analysis and the, uh, the amount of uh, information that we could gather about uh, the stakeholders were limit, uh, limited to their uh, involvement in the um, value chain stages, the sectors, the, their institutional role and capacity, so we couldn't do the in-depth analysis of the stakeholders' network analysis. However, we do think it is one of the important areas to explore, to understand the role of act uh, all these different stakeholders uh, who are involved in the innovation and understand the pattern of uh, interaction that's happening within these stakeholders and how these changes are uh, due to the influence, uh, external and internal, over time. So, next slide. So, uh, so some of the um, things um, or the uh, way forward that we see as the use of these social indicators in the assessment of the uh, bio-based value chains and to inform bioeconomic policies are, uh, one is that um, since bioeconomy has a diverse stakeholders both along the value chain upstream and downstream, and they all, all the stakeholders involved have diverse values and judgments. So it, it is very important to understand uh, the interactions and the roles of stakeholders along with their value and judgment. So there is a need of broad social network analysis of these uh, stakeholders. And the next uh, point is um, uh, the social sustainability. Uh, when it's measured by a selected set of indicators, you, we reduce uh, um, the... Uh, 
essence of the sort of the impact and the when it's reduced down to the measurable impact uh, we kind of overlook some of the uh, dynamics for example the social values and judgments uh, changes as the social construction changes and they shift so um, so from the research point of view they could be problematic and they're usually marginalized and very weakly researched not adequately researched but uh, at the decision levels we need a policy uh, mix which has a balance of both market and non-market values. So the consumer values, which are usually driven by the economic uh, values, are important, but also we need to incorporate the citizen values, which are which come from the social choices that people make. So uh, the one last point I want to make is also about how bioeconomy economy is usually driven by uh, like in a result-oriented innovation process, and the focus uh, is usually on the development of the new products and new services. But the uh, idea is that focus should also be in creating a social demand and building new social relationships and collaborations. So the shift needs to happen from the technical innovation towards the social innovations. Uh, so and so, the indicators are usually uh, used to manage implementation and to report the successes and the failures of the policies. But we also need a set of indicators which facilitate the learning in the process of this innovation. So which emphasizes on the citizen-based citizen, citizen uh, innovations. Uh, so the idea is that we, uh, as a research point of view, we need to be able to incorporate some of these uh, indicators into the uh, social sustainability research work. So yeah. I think, having said that, uh, I would like to conclude my uh, few slides here. Yeah. Uh, I believe you, um, Poppy, I believe you're muted. Apologies. Yeah. Hello, I guess I'm unmuted now. Um, thank you very much, Asha. Um, I think, um, Serena, is it okay if we take questions uh, after, uh, by the end, so that I uh, allow Thomas also to go through uh, the work on the environmental uh, sustainability and indicators? Would that be okay? That's okay. okay. Thank you, Bobby. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Christensen. I've been working with Poppy and Asha for almost two years now. Uh, so moving on to the environmental sustainability indicators, um, our work uh, attempts to combine those indicators with competitive priorities. And we wanted to find out what opportunities this brings in optimizing biomass value chains. Um, I'll be using two reports from the MAGIC and Advanced Fuel projects, which highlight a set of good practices, uh, which we can analyze um, this framework. And finally, I'll be discussing some future research, uh, which seeks to implement this conceptual approach into quantitative modeling. Uh, next slide, please, Poppy. So, as, as my other colleagues have uh, highlighted, these are the main steps to a generic biomass value chain and its respective environmental challenges. Uh, they include having a consistent or reliable biomass yields, um, the impacts on biodiversity, soil, air, and water. Uh, they all need to be monitored. Potential competition with other land uses, and finally, life cycle emissions and pollution. Uh, so some of those are more land-based and others are both land and industrial um, uh, based. So our objective is, is to turn these potential weaknesses in biomass value chain stages into good practices. Um, for example, is it possible to remediate soil uh, transform degraded or abandoned land into productive land? How can 
uh, these value chains support biodiversity instead of harming biodiversity? Um, how can they compete commercially with fossil fuels and all at the same time cutting down on emissions? So we really want to leverage the interconnectivity of all of these steps and go beyond the simple life cycle assessment. Essentially, what we're aiming at through this paper is, is to produce a framework where environmental priorities are integrated with logistical operations, uh, which basically means the crossroads between sustainability and resource efficiency. Um, and these are all clearly outlined in the objectives of the bioeconomy strategy, which includes sustainability, resource efficiency, and competitivity in the market. Uh, next slide, please, Bob. So following up on um, Poppy and Asha's input on economic and socioeconomic indicators, these are the main environmental indicators uh, that you can see on the left column. And for each stage, we found four competitive priorities, uh, innovation, transparency, flexibility, and quality. Uh, so again, what is interesting about this is establishing a link between biophysical dynamics or activities related to natural resources and commercial valuation. For example, transparency is linked to greenhouse gas emissions and land use change, uh, which means both of those produce up-to-date information about their status and their impact. This is transferable to consumers, or it's, I should say, available to consumers, which can increase trust. Um, similarly, quality provides information about the impacts on soil, biodiversity, air and water, which also informs consumers. It can, it can also inform policy when formulating uh, new standardization and certification schemes. Um, it, innovation is present in strategies which, which um, improve flexibility and intersect with sustainability. Um, indicators like sustainable harvest level, water use efficiency, soil carbon and nutrients, those are all a mix between sustainability and efficiency. Um, and ultimately, having both of those can better inform research and development as well. Um, I also highlighted a few relevant gaps within um, available policies. Uh, so there's uncertainty around current water sustainability criteria, um, and there's also a limitation in how bio-based products are labeled. Next slide, please. So the, the first project uh, that's relevant here, which uh, we are all part of, is MAGIC, which stands for Marginal Lands for Growing Industrial Crops. Um, we produced a deliverable two years ago, which highlighted cases around Europe uh, that are all at small fields or demonstration scale. Um, so this makes it a little bit difficult to replicate, um, but there are some common biophysical challenges, which each of these cases um, address. And they all compose of feedstocks with common characteristics. So some of the challenges associated with marginal lands are, for example, um, adverse terrain, if, if the slope is too steep or if it's too dry, uh, if there's too much water, is chemical contamination. Um, and there are crops that are capable of, of overcoming these. Um, so through this deliverable, we can actually start analyzing the good practices through the lens of competitive priorities. 
for example, there's innovation in the form of new crops, which are capable of um, phytoremediation, or certain crops such as black locusts have strong nitrogen fixation, which leads to uh, lower fertilization input. Um, so the innovation competitive priority is linked to two indicators, uh, bioenergy carriers per unit of cultivated area and soil carbon and nutrient indicator. Uh, these were in the previous table. So even though we have some, some good practices, uh, these are largely focused on the land use and biomass production stage. And the report actually identifies a lot of key challenges for the full value chain. For example, uh, there's a substantial burden in logistical optimization. The distance between the actual plantation and the conversion facilities uh, can generate a lot of the emissions, if not the majority of the emissions of the value chain. Um, there is uncertainty surrounding crops that have phytoremediated chemicals and their suitability for conversion facilities. There is market competition between these dedicated crops and alternative energy sources such as biomethane, biohydrogen, and waste inputs. So what this underlines is uh, the importance of competitive priorities being turned into competitive advantages because uh, things like biomethane, biohydrogen, and waste are not as much concerned with the land use stage of soil and biodiversity. Um, and a lot of these crops can actually uh, really demonstrate unique advantages that they're bringing for soil and for biodiversity. Um, there is also end use valorization from these crops. For example, bio oil, which can be extracted from poplar, has good antioxidant activity, can be used as an additive in biodiesel, um, which redefines the entire and full value chain um, and its value. I'm, I'm just going to give a side comment on biodiversity is, is, is a quite complex indicator because there's some conflicting characteristics uh, for each of these crops. Some of them are obviously designated as invasive, but at the same time, they can contribute to remediating soil, um, having a net amendment to soil and nutrients and microfauna, which can also impact uh, biodiversity positively. So in this case, we can use indicators from the CAP, for example, uh, such as farmland bird index. Next slide, please. Poppy, thank you. Uh, the next project that, that we're all three involved in is advanced fuel. This one is more concerned with the market uptake of advanced renewable fuels for the European transport sector. And one of the reports that, that we published um, looks at uh, good practices of plants or biorefineries around Europe and some key transferable lessons that, that um, they each have. So for example, some of them have uh, their raw materials as very close to the biorefinery. Uh, so they source their biomass locally. Um, some of them have very strong collaborations with their local suppliers. Some of them are co-located with larger refineries or pulp and paper mills. Um, and these are also linked to comparative priorities. Uh, for example, UPM has a plant in Finland uh, which owns its own plantations. And so there's a high degree of flexibility there in, in um, the feedstock that they use. And they also have a high degree of quality and transparency related to their soil, water, and land impacts uh, through certification schemes, which they make public. Um, other plants use some good practices for energy exchange or nutrient exchange. For example, they will extract lignin at the same time as 
sugars which become bioenergy and the lignin is used to actually power their own biorefinery um, which which adds to energy efficiency and cuts down emissions next slide please so all of this discussion i think underlines the fact that there's a lot of interconnectivity opportunities uh, for the optimization of bio, biomass value chains. Um, and this graph you can see here from Lokesh et al. really illustrates that. The advantage of biomass cascading, which is really unique to the bioeconomy, um, should be exploited. Uh, this concerns, for example, certain biomaterials that can be used for construction, and as they go into stages of end uses, they, act, they can be reused, for example, for bioenergy. So there's a lot of opportunities for the valuation of uh, biomass. So one way that uh, we attempted to um, exploit uh, this inter interconnectivity is through the modeling methodology of system dynamics which can be either through quantitative or qualitative methodology. In this case, we use quantitative, specifically for emissions accounting. Um, so we use the emissions calculation methodology from the Renewable Energy Directive in order to evaluate how um, emissions generated along the value chains are tied with soil organic carbon, energy efficiency, nutrient efficiency, and non-CO2 emissions reduction. Uh, next slide, please, Poppy. So please don't be too overwhelmed by this picture, um, but it, it may seem overwhelming, but um, the idea is to have a full and clear picture of all the main activities of the biomass value chain, in this case, a biofuel um biofuel value chain uh, and we've basically harmonized all of the units of measurements that um, are relevant so mass distance and energy uh, to create a model which can calculate um, emissions for each and all stage of the value chain as it turns out we have very few interconnectivity uh, principles illustrated here, which kind of shows you how complex it is and how challenging it is to um, really account for those. But we can still, uh, I, think, I think this is a good start uh, because, for example, practices where nutrients produced at the conversion stage can be returned to the land use stage um, and they can offset a lot of emissions from the land use stage. Um, so the idea and the future research uh, that's ongoing now for, for this model is obviously to identify competitive priorities through quantitative modeling. Um, and all four that are linked to environmental indicators that I mentioned previously, quality, transparency, innovation, and flexibility, um, can be attributed to, to actual quantitative results. And yeah, we're hoping to produce this work in the next few months. That's it for me. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just uh, illustrate uh, the landscapes we are working at the moment in the various projects. Uh, as mentioned, we're trying to uh, apply the combination of these methodologies and the, with specific indicators and provide input qualitative and quantitative uh, for future policy optimization um, at uh, European level, but also uh, in at country level uh, for uh, a list of uh, European countries um, across the project. So in land use, uh, you can see uh, with grey, we are working uh, for um, the uh, priorities that I mentioned, quality, cost, uh, innovation, uh, transparency, and we are providing a mix of quantitative and light blue data through econometric uh, modeling and uh, 
uh, in the grey some qualitative assessment and uh, we are also at the moment uh, um, quantifying the expected added, va added value in terms of profitability, jobs and gross value added uh, and also carbon farming options that can be applied through various innovative cropping uh, so that we go from uh, land use uh, uh, in the beginning to an optimized landscape of land use through uh, policy steering. Uh, for biomass production, I'm illustrating here the landscape of innovative cropping. Uh, we're going through again a mix of competitive priorities, flexibility, quality, cost uh, in innovation, and we address uh, we we have a set of quantitative in uh, light blue uh, set of metrics and also quantitative uh, qualitative uh, and we are um, measuring the added value of carbon farming the sustainable harvest levels and also the values of the market values of co-products which complement the cost efficiency so that we have an optimized biomass cropping uh, and then for conversion, uh, we're doing that for advanced fuels only. Um, and uh, uh, we go through the same uh, principles uh, through flexibility, innovation, quality and cost. And uh, uh, we uh, quantify the profitability, the gross value added per million of euros invested so that we can compare to other sectors and in, uh, in the field and also the market value of co-products as Thomas mentioned. Uh, cascading is a unique principle that can be and by refining uh, that can be applied to biomass value chains. Uh, so that was uh, more uh, the projects that uh, we apply the work are Panacea Magic and Advanced Fuel uh, and we are uh, working on uh, different uh, deliverables and reports at the moment uh, as well as hopefully on another paper at least. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and hopefully, Serena, we, we are on time. Yes, that looks fine. If you'd like to take questions now, I believe Mark has a question in the comments, but I can't see it in my comments. I can see Mark's comment. This is Asha. Did you consider a social uh, survey to triangulate, validate your choice of indicators? Uh, most of these um, three projects that we mentioned, Mark, uh, we usually state uh, within the idea that these are like in proximity with the cap indicators. I think that is our main um, uh, approach for the selection because uh, the uh, final outputs of these uh, uh, deliverables, were, for, uh, at least for our part of the work, was uh, developing a policy framework and developing a roadmap. So we state within the, um, you know, the uh, goals of the SDGs. Uh, and uh, that's why we do not do any kind of survey to validate, okay, if these are the right choices. So I think the paper that I mentioned that we presented uh, as a part of a conference paper, that's where I think that that was a part of our own initiative to say, okay, are we selecting the right set of social indicators? Is this what, because we felt it is very top down so we felt we needed to look into some of the literatures and understand if these are the indicators that would be considered important by the bottom-up approach. For example, our focus was the farmers and the agriculture community. So that's where it came. And we did see some of the similarities. There was a um, uh, focus on the employment, uh, income generating activities and the profit at the farm level. So it did. Uh, I think that was our way of validating the uh, indicators that we selected was, uh, you know, there was a commonality in the interest among the stakeholders. Thank you very much, Asha. Um, Serena, I'm not sure I can see any other questions here. Um, if someone else has uh, have any questions, they can uh, just ask or pop them in the comments box. It's uh, <coughs> it's it's Jem here. Um, hi, Poppy Asher, Thomas. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Jem. Hello. Sorry, I had to join the, the presentation a little bit late, but can I just ask, I, the European Biomass Conference has been going on, and um, it's really just an, an opinion question. 
What's your opinion about the current status of public and policy perspectives on bioenergy systems within the bioeconomy? Um, I can I can report the European biomass uh, updates. Uh, it is um, it seems that uh, who, as as reported by the European Commission and also by a couple of MEPs that uh, were participating in the debate about Green Deal and, and bioenergy, uh, that uh, biomass heat uh, is going to be focusing mainly on areas um, that are low pollution through, through pellets or stoves or efficient uh, conversion systems, but uh, not in cities and uh, certainly not in highly polluted areas. And it seems that most uh, woody biomass uh, will be uh, prioritized for uh, building renovation uh, and uh, uh, it will uh, not be um, used for, uh, let's say, energy or bioenergy. So the focus is going on uh, uh, residuals and waste, and also on uh, uh, agroecology, agro carbon farming practices, the use of abandoned land, new species. These are the buzzwords that are going around for the policy formation and strategies at the moment, as far as I've got them. I'm not sure if Thomas and Asa have something else. Yeah, so pretty much energy out. <clears throat> Um, all other uses in? Except from the advanced biofuels, uh, that uh, at least for the 2030 they're full in and also um, for 2050 it seems that uh, the advanced fuel scenarios as well have, have come out and it seemed to match other uh, work from IEA, Bioenergy, etc. They will be uh, a key component uh, in the fuel mix for uh, 2050 as well, despite the big hydrogen boom at the moment, uh, especially for aviation and maritime and uh, heavy duty, uh, not for, for mass. Uh... Right. No, thanks for that. Thank you. If, if there are no other questions, uh, uh, please feel free. All of us uh, are, are on working mode every day, so we'll be happy to, to talk or to reply to emails. Asha, Thomas can do that. Uh, I, I will be very happy as well. Uh, and also hear some recommendations or your thoughts, because I'm pretty sure some colleagues are also working on similar uh, issues. And, and if you have any suggestions for, for the approaches or uh, the indicators or the measuring uh, to inform policy, please come forward. It will be great to hear from you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye. Bye.